started off as fierce opponents, litigators, and somewhere along the line, we decided we should put our mediator hats on and facilitate dialogue between our clients. And that proved to be a very helpful exercise. And it was during that exercise that I came to know him as the mediator, not just as the attorney at law. Krishna. Sukhdeo is an attorney at law. He's been an attorney at law since 2001. He specializes in employment, commercial, and property law. He's been a certified mediator since 2007. Um, and his emphasis has been civil, family, commercial, and personal injury mediation matters. Please welcome Krishna now to share his thoughts with us on this topic. Madam Chairperson, thank you for the warm and cordial welcome. Distinguished members of the board, fellow peacemakers, good afternoon to you all. Um, this afternoon, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so bear with me. But I do have quite a bit of information to go through with you that relates to personal injury matters. And I thought it wise, after listening to many of the presentations yesterday and today, and I was fortunate to be in Madam Justice Pemberton's session in the afternoon yesterday, which chronicled the responsibilities of attorneys and mediators where preparation is, re is mandatory and required. And what we have heard from my fellow panelists, the distinguished Sebasi and Mr. Mendez, is what reverberates is the need for preparation and I'm going to just briefly look at some of the practice directions, which I'm assuming most of the attorneys went for part two with Justice Pemberton, so we have, may have some among us and other mediators. Think of the question, I'll leave this question with you while I start. What can we do to enhance the mediation process? against the background of preparation. Now, we're talking about Justice Devine's indicated that we are on the threshold of mandatory mediation and the practice directions that governed the pilot project will shortly become a rule of court and we'll have mandatory mediation. Now, what does that mean to us as mediators and attorneys. Today I am going to wear both caps, mediator and attorney, not at the same time. Now, the point of departure for me will be just reading some excerpts from what is a pre-action protocol letter, because I see us in engaging in personal injury mediation from two distinct heads. One is through the court, through mandatory mediation, and the other is where we have had the pledge to mediate or parties of their own volition choose to mediate. Both may result in a solution or partial solution, or sometimes we don't have a solution and then we have litigation. But in the court part of it, we have a pre-action protocol, which is a document that is part of our rules and it guides us as attorneys what we are supposed to do before we file this action. And some of the highlights would be in personal injury matters, you 
must send to the other side a detailed claim. It's called a letter before claim. And there are sanctions that are imposed if you don't comply. Now, that's a very long document, and I would urge all mediators to become intimately familiar with it because it's going to assist you when you are sitting in that room mediating and you are confronted with, as my friend Mr. Mendez indicated, people are not prepared. And you may want to point them to the pre-action protocol and ask, is there any reason why documents were not exchanged? And I'll just read from you 2.2, which says, the letter shall contain a clear summary of facts on which the claim is based, an indication of the nature of any injury suffered, C, where the claimant was treated an attending physician, D, the dates of receiving treatment, E, the extent of the injuries to date, F, details of property damage, G, if the claimant can address issues of quantum in detail, the quantum of the overall claim, with particulars of same and supporting documentation, and H, any other relevant information specific to the individual case. Now bear in mind that this is done at the pre-action level. Nothing is filed. You are now going to engage the other side in negotiations. And as you can see, it's quite a detailed list. Now if I were to put my mediator's hat on, and I've been privileged to be on the court annexed panel. And I would join with my friend, Ms. Mendes is also on the panel, and share with you some of my experience. One that reverberates is a lack of preparedness. The pre-action protocol letters are bare bones lacks particulars which one must comply with by law. So right off the bat, attorneys are failing at the pre-action level. So it, it is something that we need to think about in terms of how do we encourage parties to comply. And that's the first question that I asked for you to, to consider. Now, this responsibility does not end with the claimant. There are also coordinate responsibility or reciprocal responsibilities to the defendant. And at 2.10 in the, the practice direction, it says, the def if the defendant denies liability, he should enclose with a letter of reply documents in his possession which are material to the issues between the parties and which would be likely to be ordered to be disclosed by the court either on an application for pre-action disclosure or on disclosure during proceedings. Now we see a, a further evolution in, in the thought process here. Anything that you have to disclose in the process of personal injuries litigation, the practice direction is saying disclose it. There's no secret anymore. On a mediator's, from a mediator's perspective, I've asked this question to many practicing attorneys and mediators. What do you think is the benefit of not disclosing and I'm hoping that you, you can help me with this later on. Here you are in an environment that is privileged and confidential. As an attorney, I have always found it to be beneficial to disclose and have a testing ground for some parts of my claim which the other side 
will shed light on either disabusing me of it or forcing me to go and build a stronger case. And this I'm doing at a pre-action level. So for me as an attorney, it was always helpful to disclose everything. And as the practice direction says, you ought to disclose it because the overriding objective is to seek settlement, early settlement, avoid the escalation of costs as a learned friend from Jamaica, Mr. Basiek, set out in his slideshow. Um, there are more benefits than detriments. I can't find any detriments so far. So I wouldn't go further into any more practice directions or rules of court. The Honorable Justice Kokram shared with me this afternoon, after much pulling on his part, some of the statistics from the court. And I think when my learned friend Mr. Mendes spoke about what prolongs litigation, is it the cost issue? Parties downstream who may be at, um, doctors that need to do procedures and enhance their own or advance their own interests by increasing those costs. It's important to look at the statistics and see how does that play out. And I, and I didn't get a, a chance to analyze them in much detail because they were presented by, to me during the lunch break. So I'm just going to read from and share with you over the last five years, personal injury matters, which in this jurisdiction we put under the head of running down matters. Justice Stolmeyer would be very familiar with that. Um, in 2009, we had 865 matters filed. 2010, 793. 2011, 832. 2012, 827. 2013, 846. So for the last three years, I would say we are averaging 830 matters being filed. Significant. It's significant when we look at what Justice Devines pointed out this morning to us, that if one were to extrapolate the pilot project, taking 50% of the matters that go to trial out of the system will be significant. And I'll share with you some of those statistics. Now, working with this, this number of 830 around there, over the years, we have seen, the statistics have demonstrated that over 60% of the matters are either a notice of full satisfaction is filed, a consent order at the case management conference, or the matter is discontinued, order by consent at the pretrial review, order by consent trial. Now, I would want to group all of these in terms of a negotiated settlement involving attorneys and some assistance from the judge who may ask you, where are you going with this, Mr. Sopel? A very pointed question. And maybe you would want to take some time to have a word with your client outside. At that point, you pick your papers up and you say, thank you, my lord. And you go outside and take the hit. You have very little chance of success or what you're asking for may be too much. And that is why I would include the judicial input into that settlement. So we have, if one were to look at the other head, which is judgment and final order, here is where we have matters progressing to trial. And uh, for the years 2009 to 2013, we have had numbers of 158, 183, 227, 
248 and 208 respectively, which averages between 23 and 27 percent of matters filed end up before the courts. With mediation, judging from the recent pilot project, that may be reduced to close to 10 percent, 10 to 12 percent. So it is significant when one looks at the statistics, it, it shows and it, it tells us that a lot of negotiation and a lot of settlement is happening in personal injury matters. You have, I would say, close to 80% of the matter being resolved before trial. The 20% is what can we do to assist in this process. We have an issue of the compliance with the rules. How do we encourage parties to file these documents? How do we address the issue of costs, which has been five minutes? 